This is season two of Mobile Suit Breakdown, a podcast about Japanese sci-fi mega franchise Mobile Suit Gundam for new fans, old fans, and not yet fans, where we watch, analyze, and review all 40 years of the iconic anime in the order it was made. We research its influences, examine its themes, and discuss how each piece of the Gundam canon fits within the changing context in Japan and the world from 1979 to today. This is episode 2.3, A Boy Named Sue, and we're your hosts. I'm Tom, lifelong Gundam fan, and getting over a cold, so I hope my voice sounds better to you than it does to me. And I'm Nina, recent mecha anime convert and suffering for my art today. <laughs> We recorded this week's bonus episode last night, uh, which entailed drinking a lot of beer and talking about some of the strange mobile suit designs from the period between First Gundam and Zeta. <laughs> mobile Suit Breakdown is made possible by the support of 128 patrons. Thank you all, and special thanks go out to our 18 newest patrons. Wow. Tom, Kai B, Tyler D, Brett M A, Wilton A, Corey H, Tokyo Marcus, Reg X, Macho Models, Phil A, Denise H, Lucas LG, Louie N, Inconsiderate Ninja, <laughs> Rhett L, Kaiser, Matthew B, and Flugmorph. <laughs> We are only $40 away from our first funding goal. If you've been thinking of becoming a patron, now is the time. <laughs> Patrons, depending on level, get a shout out on the podcast, entry in all of our seasonal giveaways, recognition on our website, access to a patron discord, bonus content, behind the scenes exclusives, and physical Mobile Suit Breakdown merch like art prints, pins, and t-shirts. Find out more at GundamPodcast.com slash Patreon. And we are starting to work on the plans for our Zeta seasonal giveaway, so stay tuned for those. We also just launched our merch store. This is going to be different merch than the patron exclusives, but we've got t-shirts, we've got art prints, we've got shower curtains. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you want to wrap Mobile Suit Breakdown in every aspect of your life, we have you covered for that. Tom created some really wonderful, fun designs, and you can get them put on all kinds of different clothing, accessories, and household products. You can find all of that at GundamPodcast.com slash store. We're going to do something a little bit different with our last week ons this season, and I hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to TNN, the Titans News Network, rated number one for news about space by Earthnoids around the world. Our top story tonight, the cowardly spacenoid terrorists calling themselves the AUG have struck again, this time attacking the civilian colony of Green Oasis in the Side 7 region. I guess you could say they are AEUG. A spokesperson for the Titans assured us that the criminals responsible for this heinous act will be swiftly brought to justice. Reports of a simultaneous infiltration into the high-security Grips colony are no doubt mere AU propaganda. In other news, the authorities are telling all loyal citizens to contact your local military police representative if you spot a mysterious man in red or a very angry young man driving a military jeep. Stay safe, and remember, gravity is your friend. This week we are going to be covering... Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam Episode 2, Departure. We also have research about bird lime, how colonialism connects to Zeta Gundam, and the name of our main character. But first, the recap. The spaceship Argama fires on the colony, 
and with one more shot from a mobile suit, Lieutenant Quattro and his men open a hole in the cylinder. A rush of air leaving the colony pushes them back, and Quattro can hear heavy breathing, but has no idea where it might be coming from. He wonders again if it is Amuro Rey or Lala Soon, but decides it isn't either. As they enter the colony, Quattro announces their mission, to capture a Mark II mobile suit. Inside the colony, Camille is running again, this time through the woods and back toward the military base. As he watches one Mark II move the crashed Mark II, he mutters to himself that he cannot forgive those soldiers. What good is an army that only recruits those born on Earth? The pilot of the crashed Mark II turns out to be the blonde Titan, the one who made fun of Camille, Lieutenant Jared. He gets a dressing down from another Titan, Lieutenant Emma, but is unapologetic. He hasn't damaged the mobile suit, and anyway, Lieutenant Emma is not his superior. Captain Bright asks them why they're standing around. Haven't they heard the alarms that indicate a hole in the colony? Jared thinks it's just a meteor, but Bright is quick to point out that, having just arrived from Earth, Jared doesn't know anything about life in the colony. They should prepare as though the colony is under attack. Quattro mentally prepares himself. Some collateral damage to the colony is inevitable, but will be worthwhile if they can capture a Mark II. A group of Federation gyms muster to fight off Quattro and his men, but are no match for the newer mobile suits and their veteran pilots. On a nearby ship, several Titans officers argue over why Ayug is attacking the colony, Green Noah 1, and whether the pilot of the red mobile suit could be the Red Comet. A Lieutenant Bidan jokes that Ayug can have all the data they want about the Mark II, but is told off, and the group head to Green Noah 2 to better monitor the battle. Back on Green Noah 1, the battle continues. Mobile suits careen into residential streets, and Camille's friend, who we now know is called Fa, just narrowly avoids crashing her car into the wreckage outside her home. The evacuation order has gone out, and Fa and her mother join other families in seeking shelter. Fa's mother wonders why they are being attacked, but Fa is certain that their colony, now a Titan's base, is hated by other space noids. The locals had no choice in the matter, but that doesn't make any difference. Camille returns to the base. When the gate guards stop him, he tells them he is looking for his father, Lieutenant Franklin, and they let him pass. The Mark IIs have been sent out to fight, even though most of their pilots don't even have simulation experience yet. As Lieutenant Emma reports for duty, Camille dashes past and climbs onto the MS, even as Captain Bright shouts at him to stop, and the foot of another mobile suit smashes through the roof of the hangar. Spotting the MP who harassed and beat him earlier, Camille gets into the cockpit, already familiar with the Mark II's controls from secretly reading the specs on his dad's computer. Despite the insistence of everyone around that an amateur could never pilot the Mark II, that it's too dangerous for a child, Camille gets it up and running, and Bright thinks to himself that this boy might be another Amaro. Quattro and his men land nearby, ready to capture a Mark II and leave the colony. Although he recognizes the danger he's in, liable to be targeted by either side of the fight, Camille only cares about finding the MP who arrested and beat him. He jumps toward the man, knocking him to the ground, and his voice rings out from inside the mobile suit. Shall I give you a lesson on how painful and frightening it is to be clobbered? He fires his Vulcan cannons to either side, and laughs as the MP cowers pathetically. Quattro realizes that this particular Mark II is on their side, which Camille confirms over a loudspeaker. I'll prove it to you, he tells them, before charging forward and knocking the other Mark II into the building behind it. Camille threatens to destroy the mobile suit and the pilot inside it unless the pilot surrenders and leaves the cockpit. The incredulous pilot freezes, but Bright orders him to do as Camille says. As the Aeug soldiers and Camille fly toward the opening inside of the colony, Camille looks down and sees his home, reduced to smoke and rubble by the fighting. Quattro checks on him, and Camille finally confirms he is coming with them. His hatred for the Federation and the Titans makes it an easy choice. Captain Basque of the Titans debriefs several pilots and officers trying to determine what went wrong. Bright storms in, less angry about the stolen mobile suit than about the damage to the colony. Why was Mark II testing done here? If it had been done on Green Noah II, they would have avoided any risk to civilians. Calmly, Basque walks over and sucker punches Bright, a massive hit that knocks Bright to the ground. A common officer like you shouldn't talk back. Ayug have joined forces with the Federation's enemies, Zeon, and we will never defeat Ayug if we have to worry about space noids. Undeterred by the punch, Bright stands and counters that by turning the colony into a Titan's base, they actually make Ayug stronger. Why won't they listen to reason? Another Titan's officer, lower ranking than Bright, hits him. Bright is shocked, but the Titans consider themselves above Federation rules. The other officers in the room join in beating Bright, all except for Lieutenant Emma, who stands waiting near the door. 
The Ayug soldiers and Camille leave the colony and are quickly pursued by three more Titans' mobile suits. Quattro holds them off until the Argama can provide cover fire, and then leads his men and Camille to the rendezvous point. Camille, on his way to an uncertain future, can't help but feel that there is something nostalgic about being in space. The big question we were both asking ourselves throughout this entire episode was, what is Camille's plan? What is Camille doing here? And why? <laughs> what, is, what does he think he's going to accomplish? He ends the previous episode fleeing from internment at the Titan's base. He steals a jeep. He breaks through the perimeter. He abandons the jeep and is in some woods. Sort of the last important thing he does in the episode is he buries his face in the grass and he says, what am I going to do now? Which feels like a fairly true teen experience, right? You've gotten into trouble. You've done some impulsive things that have made the trouble worse. As an adult, I can look at that situation and say like, well, if your parents could gloss over the first part, they can probably gloss over the second part. Mm -hmm. You're in some trouble, but it's probably not the end of the world. Like you just you go home and you take your lumps, right? But as a teenager, I think <laughs> I would have done what Camille does, and I would have dug myself in deeper. Well, so fundamentally, the question is, is he digging himself in deeper because he's just flailing? And I don't think he does. This is another episode that, for me, gained a lot with a second watch through. Okay. Because the first time, my reaction was that he's just flailing. Like, what? <laughs> what on earth do you think you're doing? But Nina, he's not on Earth. <laughs> Got a little operatic in there. <laughs> I saw much more deliberateness in his behavior the second time around. Mm -hmm. He makes the decision to go back to the base. He makes the decision to go to the hangar with the Mark II in it. He moves very purposefully to get into that Mark II. <laughs> His decision to attack and intimidate that MP felt like opportunism and impulsiveness. Yeah, when he decided to go and steal that Mark II, he had no idea the MP was going to be there. No, but he, but I think he did decide to steal the, mm. the Mark II. It may have been slightly impulsive, but I, I think there was some thought and some plan that preceded the action. Yeah. Now, I want to point something out here. In a sense, the episode opens with Camille, but not directly. It opens with Camille as perceived through Lieutenant Quattro's new type intuition. Because the first thing that happens in the episode is the, the Agama blows a hole in the wall of the colony, and then Quattro and his team infiltrate. But he can hear Camille's heavy breathing as Camille is running through the forest. There's a connection established between the two of them at that point. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Camille decides to do exactly the same thing that Quattro has decided to do, and steal a Mark II. Either their thoughts are just like running directly parallel, and that's part of what is connecting them, or there's some sort of feedback between the two of them and we, we saw both of them feeling that connection in the previous episode. It didn't seem to influence their behavior at that time, but yeah. It's a little much to believe that they both, at the same time, while experiencing a moment of new type connection, decided to do the same exact thing, and that there was no influence of one on the other when they decided to do that. We will get back to his plan, or lack thereof, in a moment. But we have to talk about his interaction <laughs> with that MP. You mean when he laughs maniacally yep. and terrorizes the MP? And let's be real here. Camille has never piloted a Mark II before. This is his first time in one. He does a lot of things that could very easily have killed that man if he'd made a mistake. It seems clear that his intent is to terrorize rather than kill. Mm -hmm. He wants this person to feel as frightened and as angry as he has felt. As, as powerless. As powerless as Camille has felt. But he doesn't intend to kill him. But he could easily have done so on accident. I mean, he's, he's firing his Vulcans at him. He's stepping very close on either side. Uh, he has this little taste of power. And we touched early on on the fact that mobile suits are a power fantasy for children because it brings you into parity with adults. Like, once you're inside the mobile suit, what matters is how good you are at using the mobile suit. Not the fact that this person is older or bigger than you. 
Well, and this is a slightly different version of that because in this situation, Camille is not just on parity with this MP. The situation is reversed. Now Camille is bigger and stronger and can do whatever he likes and the MP can do nothing about it. It's like when Camille was being held in the detention cell and then when Camille was being held by two other MPs while this first one beat him with a club. The mobile suit has turned the tables and given Camille the power. Not just equivalent power, but domineering power. The power to inflict terror and to make other people feel how he feels. So we can perhaps expand on the idea presented in a, a text that I read way back about a lot of fantasy and science fiction aimed at young people being about power mm -hmm. and expand this idea to include like any disenfranchised person. Yeah. That especially in science fiction, technology in the same way magic would be in a fantasy <laughs> novel, technology is about bridging these power gaps, is about elevating a, a powerless or less powerful group so that they can compete with or supersede whoever has, because of the structures of society, been uh, in a position above them. My first reaction <laughs> to that scene was, aren't there more important things to do, you maniac? <laughs> and there are, but, you know, let's make allowances for his age mm -hmm. and for the fact that for as long as he can remember, he's been a spacenoid living here. You live in this openly antagonistic society that oppresses you and abuses you at every turn where you just have to eat it. If you fight back, you're lucky if all you get is a beating. And here he has this chance, mm -hmm. <laughs> this opportunity to turn the tables. And of course, he's going to relish it in that moment. And not only does he have power, he literally has the tool of the oppressor. He has a Titan's mobile suit under his control. And then his decision to take the Mark II that he's in and steal the other Mark II and escape along with Lieutenant Quattro and the other two Rick Diaz pilots at that point is completely sensible. Because at that point, what else is he going to do? He has pushed things so far now that the only option left to him is to escape and run away and join the Rebel Alliance. <laughs> I can't help but wonder, though, if this wasn't perhaps something he had already thought of. And maybe running away to join Aug was something that he intended to do after he finished high school or mm -hmm. at some later date. Mm -hmm. I think that's very likely. Things have transpired that make now the time to do that. <laughs> but his apparent comfort with it, the fact that he doesn't seem at all panicked about leaving home or his friends behind, there's no sense of like, what did I just do? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a certain resignation. I hate the Federation forces. I hate the Titans. I have hated them for a long time. The logical next step of that is that I'm going to join Ayug and become one of those people criticizing the government on Earth. Yeah, I don't know if we're ever going to get any confirmation or flashbacks. That doesn't really feel like Tomino's style. Mm -hmm. But the way in which Camille behaves in this episode and the emotions he displays makes me think this was maybe his plan all along, just got sped up a little bit, mm -hmm. and he decided to take the opportunity that was presented to him. Yeah. Interesting, then, that Camille's dad seems to be in the army. Another point in favor of Camille having planned this all along, <laughs> to some degree, he mentions having looked up information about the Mark II on his father's computer. When he gets into the Mark II, he says something about the data I got from dad's computer is coming in handy. Like, yeah, it seems like his dad must have been involved in the development of the Mark II in some way, which really makes him seem like another Amaro. But he's clearly our Amaro. That's why I don't like him yet. <laughs> I'll like him later. And in this episode, Bright sees him piloting the Mark II and goes, I'm getting the same vibes from that kid that I got from Amaro. Well, and Quattro says the same thing. When he gets the vibes, he thinks it's either <laughs> Amaro, Amaro or right. Lala. Lala soon. Which is weird because has he not encountered another single new type in seven years? Like what? Well, and how did he even know Amaro and Lala? Ha ha ha. We all know it's Char. Three or four different people are like, oh, just like the Red Comet. Does Char seem like the kind of guy to change his name and assume a new identity? I think not. In another parallel to First Gundam, 
We have Fa. We have her name now. Hi, Fa. I mean, Fra. I mean, Fa. <laughs> uh, splitting up with her family as the side is being evacuated to go check on her friend, Amaro. I mean, Camille. Camaro. Amil. And his room is full of mechanical stuff that he's working on and awards. Yeah, it felt very reminiscent. Even more precisely reminiscent, when Fra goes to Amuro's room in that first episode, she does go through his cupboards trying to decide what to take and what to leave, just like Fa does in Camille's room. When Camille first gets into the Mark II, he thinks he's going to have to fight the Ayug guys, presumably because he hasn't had an opportunity to contact them yet, mm -hmm. and he knows he's in a Federation mobile suit, so of course, if they think there's someone in there, they might attack it. Camille definitely assumes that everyone is hostile to him and every situation he's in is going to turn violent. And based on what we've seen of him in the show so far, we really have no reason to think he's wrong about that. In a contrast to First Gundam, we don't see any struggle, really, with piloting. Camille is apparently a natural or has enough experience from his various junior competitions that this is not difficult for him. I think it's the experience. He has been piloting some version of a mobile suit for a while now. I did, however, like that when he does that tricky bit of flying to leave the colony, where the hole in the exterior of the colony is partially patched, so it's kind of tricky to get through, you can almost feel him holding his breath yeah. as he goes out into space. They do such a good job of making that look difficult. And making that moment of entering space in a mobile suit feel important. Yeah. He crossed the point of no return some time ago, but this feels like crossing a threshold. Yeah, when he's leaving the colony and he sees his destroyed home, that is the you definitely cannot go home again moment. Like what you have done at this point makes it impossible for you to turn back. And that's what drives it home. But then it is that crossing of the threshold through the hole in the colony. And then it's like, wow. Well, we feel his his awe of space. Mm -hmm. We can feel, I don't want to say how much he loves it because it's not, I mean, awe is the only word. The awesome in the biblical sense. <laughs> Vast, limitless. That feeling coming over him as he goes out into space. And the fact that they are able to convey that with animation, sounds, and music, and basically no dialogue is really incredible to me. It's very impressive. There's a moment in the hero's journey, which the hero's journey is sort of a framework for how certain heroic stories from ancient myth to modern day stories function. And there's a stage in the hero's journey where the hero, this is very early on, but the hero crosses the threshold and they leave the small world that they've known and they enter the wider world. Sounds about right. Finally, his last line is he says he gets a nostalgic feeling in space, which to our knowledge, it's not as if he's piloted a mobile suit <laughs> out in space before, and he seems to find it a little inexplicable too. There's a sense of what is this nostalgic feeling? Right, because he's just said, oh, I'm not accustomed to being in space, and yet. Which makes me wonder, as a new type, is he feeling some connection to Lala? who we know is sort of drifting about in the ether of time and space. <laughs> and that's why it feels nostalgic. Perhaps. Is he someone reincarnated? Like, there are all mm. these sort of metaphysical <laughs> questions that come up for me. So I think we've seen just in these two episodes that Camille's new type abilities are manifesting in kind of a different way. Now, we noticed in First Gundam that everybody's new type abilities were a little bit different. And for Camille... Some of his abilities are similar to what Amuro displayed, but he's had a connection to space as a thing, as a concept, since the first episode. We talked about how much he loved seeing space. And when he's in the interrogation chamber and he's exhausted and he has this like new type of vision, he looks between his legs and he can like see through the colony, see into mm -hmm. the expanses of space. There's something about Camille and space. There's a connection there that doesn't exist for a lot of the other new types that we've met. Other new types who are more connected to people, for instance, or Char, who it seems was mostly able to predict things that were going to happen. Speaking of Char, he gets <laughs> name dropped three times in this episode despite not appearing in it. 
a bunch of people keep asking whether or not the red comet is here. There is a red mobile suit. True. And nobody else does that. Only the red comet. <laughs> so you say. Although I could easily see in the Universal Century the Red Comet becoming a bit like the Dread Pirate Roberts. Oh, yeah. Well, or just like every two-bit mercenary and, you know, Xeon remnant ace pilot painting their mobile suits red just to like either try to convince their enemies that they are really the Red Comet or bask in some of that reflected glory. Especially since no one knows what has happened to Shar. We know. Do we? Yes. <laughs> One of the things that really characterizes Quattro in both of these episodes so far is a sense of emotional distance and aloofness. He says things that suggest regret and reluctance to do the kind of large-scale chaotic violence that he then freely and willingly engages in. He There's says, no emotion in it, though. It, it sounds very pro forma. He's saying those things because he's expected to say them. Right. Not because he feels it. Right. There's like, oh, it's too bad, but inevitable that the colony is going to suffer a bit of damage. All right, let's blow holes in the colony. and Let's crush all. some houses. Right. Blow up all of these gyms. The mobile suit, not the exercise facility. <laughs> Although maybe they also blew up some gyms. I don't know. Uh, hey, it could have happened. And I assume it is his sense of new type connection with Camille that allows him to have so much trust right off the bat. He doesn't really question why some random person would mm -hmm. hop into Mark II, mm -hmm. help them fight their way out, and then join them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Camille explains, I hate the Federation and I hate the Titans even more, so I'm coming with you. He might also just assume that it's natural that any right-thinking space noid would hate the Titans and hate the Federation and be chomping at the bit to join the AUG, the first opportunity. We see if he really is Char, his piloting has not gotten rusty. Everyone keeps commenting on, why can't I hit him? <laughs> He's so fast. I'm going to entertain for a minute this ridiculous notion you have that Lieutenant Quattro is actually Char Astable. Because if he is Char, that's a big if, it would be interesting how different his strategy is in these first couple of episodes versus in the first two episodes of First Gundam. Because in both cases, we have a mobile suit infiltration of a colony where a new Gundam-type mobile suit is being developed. In First Gundam, Char's orders were basically destroy it all. Destroy the Gundams, destroy the gun cannons, destroy the gun tanks, try to destroy the white base, blow the whole thing up. And once Amuro was in the Gundam, Char did everything he could to try to beat Amuro and destroy the Gundam. Lieutenant Quattro, perhaps learning a lesson from Char's mistakes, instead steals the Gundam and brings the Amuro with him. <laughs> he is learning. <laughs> All right, Titans time. We learn a bit more about the Titans, or Titanzu, in this episode, and what their whole deal is. This is where we get confirmation that they are elevated above and separate from the regular forces. And this is driven home for us and for all of the characters when a couple of low-ranking Titans officers brutally beat Captain Bright for an extended period of time, even though he is a superior officer and they get no visible consequences. We also get a little more insight into the Titans and Ayug. I will say up front, I don't think any of what we hear in these first couple of episodes is 100% the true story. Ah, classic Gundam. And because the politics of Gundam, at least in the first season, are very complicated and are not black and white, it's very likely that is the same case here. <laughs> the Titans are clearly horrible. The Titans are clearly our baddies. In the same way that, you know, by the end of the series, Zeon was clearly our baddies. But our opposing side is not 100% good. No. We saw a lot of very troubling signs from the Federation in the first series, which has now grown into this full-blown, brutalistic occupation force. Right. 
And while Ayug seem like the plucky, independence-focused rebels, I strongly suspect we're going to see some darkness there. I guess I'm a little confused. What is it about starting a mobile suit fight in a civilian colony that makes you think Ayug maybe has a dark side? <laughs> it's not even just that. Emma says that the goal of the Titans is to mop up Xeon remnants. That fight was a long time ago, but, you know, perhaps there's still some Xeon people knocking around causing trouble. Maybe. I don't know. I don't totally buy it. <laughs> she also seems young and perhaps naive. And not totally on board with what the Titans are up to. She tries to stop Bright's beating. She doesn't really try to stop it, but she does look askance at it. Well, she protests it and goes to help him up, and she's ordered to leave him alone. Mm -hmm. Then, Basque, the Titan's commander in this vicinity, mm -hmm. I don't know how high up in the whole thing he is, mentions that Ayug have joined forces with Zeon to fight against the Earth government, which makes it sound as if there is some kind of Zeon government extant that is still fighting against the Federation, but that the Zeon government and Ayug are independent of each other. Mm -hmm. They are allies, but they are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's important when you look at the Titans to remember that even though they look like an army, they wear uniforms, they pilot mobile suits, they have these big, highly industrialized military style bases, they are not an army. They are sort of a police force. They are a militarized state security apparatus. They are not the army, they are more like the Gestapo or the Stasi. So their purpose is not to fight an external enemy, but to maintain something like order. And that changes the nature of their work very much. And it inherently creates a level of hostility between the Titans and the space noids who they are policing. Because in a war, in theory, the army is protecting the civilians. And they might do a bad job of it sometimes, but that's theoretically their purpose. But here, for the Titans, every space noid is a potential enemy. Every space noid is a potential member of Ayug or Xeon Remnant. And when Bright criticizes Basque for running training operations inside of a civilian colony, Basque says... Our job is to defeat Ayug. There is no way that we can do that if we spend our time worrying about the rights and the lives of native space noids. I don't know if you noticed this, but when Bright brings that up, he uses the old colony name. He doesn't call it Grips. Mm. He calls it Green Noah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, Bright is in a very interesting position that I think we're going to look into more and more. He's still with the Federation Army, but he's not part of the Titans. He's he been promoted. He's a captain now, a Chusa, but he doesn't really have very much authority. He flies a shuttle. A little, a pretty small, sad little shuttle. <laughs> well, and this is known, right? Because when he tries to take command at the Mark II hangar, while the one that Jared crashed is being repaired, one of the techs is like, oh, the captain of the Temptation is going to be taking command. Yeah, we know that Bright is from Earth, but we also know he has lived in space a long time now. He has that great moment when he chews one of the Titans out, and he's like, how would somebody who just arrived from Earth know what's going on? When in the first episode of First Gundam, Bright was that guy who just arrived from Earth for the very first time. In yet another parallel to First Gundam, we have Fa's mother explaining that the colony was not given any choice in the uh, the posting of a uh, titan space here it's implied that they really didn't want the titan space here and <laughs> it was put here anyway and has put them all in danger and made their colony a target of the hatred of other space noids that it's established very clearly by this conversation between fa and fa's mother mm -hmm. space noids hate the titans <laughs> <laughs> So if you thought maybe it was just Camille getting picked on, you're wrong. <laughs> and this really highlights the dilemma that civilians who live near one of these colonial administration bases suffer. They don't support the Titans any more than any other space noid does, but they will always be the ones suffering the collateral damage when other space noids try to strike out at the Titans. And Bright circles back to this point. You know, he tries to explain to them, the more damage you cause, 
to this Spacenoid community, the more harm, the more abusive you are, the more power you give to Ayug. You are driving people to Ayug through your behavior. But of course, they don't want to hear it. No. Or don't really care because they're totally fine killing Spacenoid rebels. So, From a certain sort of perspective, if the Titans only exist in order to hunt down Xeon remnants and destroy Ayug, then... As long as there are Xeon remnants and AU, <laughs> the Titans will continue to accumulate power. But if they ever actually succeed in their mission, they will no longer be necessary. A couple of design <laughs> points about the Titans. The first time I saw Jared without his helmet on, I was like, oh, new slugger. <laughs> He's tall and blonde and white and kind of square jawed. And he has the hair. Very cocky. Yep. Oh, that hair. It looks a little like Guile from Street Fighter, <laughs> but a little more mullety in the back. Lots of mullety haircuts. I'm not feeling it. It was the 80s. Also, when we see the pilot who Camille attacks and orders out of the Mark II. Cacricon. I noticed that the way the, the emblem on the chest of his normal suit looks very reminiscent of the Xeon Eagle emblem. Yeah, it does. Especially as it was depicted on on Char's uniforms. Sort of gold with wings branching from the center. It looks a bit more uh, clean-lined and modern. It looks less detailed, but it looks very similar. <laughs> yeah. You'll notice also that as I pointed out last episode, the Titans' uniforms are all very disparate. So Jared's normal suit doesn't have that. Jared's normal suit has a completely different decoration. I also get a very Soviet vibe from Basque's uniform. Mm. I'm going to need to do some research and see where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. But the way that the chest of the black overcoat or overshirt fastens, the little cap, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing and we are into the cold war at this point yeah when first gundam was made the cold war was going through a period of thawing of rapprochement things were getting better it seemed like maybe the cold war was coming to an end but by the time zeta was made that was over the soviet union had invaded afghanistan the cold war was about as tense as it was ever going to get right now and while i will have to do research on the prevailing public opinion in Japan, Japan's position vis-a-vis -vis the United States, the mutual protection treaties, the bases, mm -hmm. made Japan the sort of Western frontier <laughs> of American influence. Like a fortress, fortress Japan, a bulwark against communism in Asia. Yeah, that was really the, the purpose it was meant to serve from the beginning, from the time of the occupation, the United States considered the Soviet Union a threat. <laughs> And that the U.S. position in Japan could be a defensive line against that threat. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be weird to make some of the villains reminiscent of the Soviets. Return of the gyms! Sort of. <laughs> I believe those are actually gym twos, somewhat upgraded versions of the original gym. However, they are by now quite antiquated, as one of the gym pilots points out. We are beginning in this episode to see something that I would have thought was characteristic of Gundam, but doesn't come up in the first one much. Perhaps it will get to be more and more significant as we go on. But it is what I lovingly refer to as machine porn. <laughs> I think it's a fairly common term, but what I mean by that for anyone who's not familiar is these kind of close-in loving pans on parts of the machinery of the Gundam that is very much about, look at this beautiful, shiny machinery. Right. Look at how amazing it is. Look at how it works. You know, like in TV, when we talk about the male gaze, you know, when the camera zooms in on an actress's rear or chest for no apparent reason, <laughs> just because, well, we want to look at those things, uh, we being the men filming or directing or whatever. Uh, <laughs> similarly, there's no story reason that we need to get these close-ups of various parts of the mobile suits, except that for people who really like machinery, there's that appeal of, 
oh, look at how it all fits together and look at the design and oh, it's so cool. <laughs> we also see an interesting bit of technological interplay. The Titans are using a mobile suit that looks very much like the Zeon Zaku. Indeed, that is the Hyzak, which like the Jim 2 is a somewhat upgraded version of the Zaku. Yeah, the Titans have both Jim 2s and Hyzaks, which is very interesting. It's going to be a monster of a research piece. We will probably have to focus in somewhat, but there is a lot of technology that we use now, and not all of it military technology, but it was developed out of Nazi research. True. I noticed this was especially true with the gyms during the colony battle, but we are already seeing the line that separates the pilot from the mobile suit starting to get fuzzy. We see quite a bit of pilot gore in these episodes, including in one scene, a particularly gruesome bit with some fingers coming off when the mobile suit yeah. explodes. Yeah. Um, yeah, gory. And unlike when a similar thing happened to Kaecilia at the end of First Gundam, it happens slower. It happens in the front of the shot. So it's much clearer what's happening. It's harder to miss, whereas with the Kaecilia bit, it was harder to see. But then we're also going to see a bunch of shots of gyms coming apart with internal bits going everywhere, cables, components, what feels a bit like the organs of these, of these mobile suit bodies coming apart. And bits of armor. and Yeah. And we're going to see gyms, instead of just getting hit and exploding, which is very much how it goes in First Gundam, we're going to see them littering the ground like corpses in the postures of like dead people. We're also going to occasionally see some kind of fluid, either it's oil or lubricant of some kind, but we're going to see things leaking from the bodies of these mobile suits that looks almost precisely like blood would. Yeah, it does seem like they'd like to further emphasize the mobile suit as body mm -hmm. and bring back some of the horror of yes. those deaths. Absolutely, they're bringing back the horror. That we get a bit sort of inured to over time mm -hmm. watching the first series, especially because they tend to just explode. So if we don't see the pilot... Yeah, we're very much back in the cockpit now. Yes, we are. And changes in the designs of the cockpit make that much better. There's no explanation for this, and they don't really need one. But you notice now when people are in the cockpits, they're almost surrounded by screen. It's almost as if the, they can see through the entirety of the cockpit into the outside world. All of their control panels are uh, holographic and see-through. They don't feel as separated from the outside world as they did from inside the cockpits of those first-gen mobile suits. Yeah, they have the panoramic cockpits now. The screen's everywhere. And even when we're not in the cockpit with them... There's a strong sense of wanting to remind us that it is piloted. <laughs> These aren't being remote controlled from somewhere else. There's a human person in there. So mm -hmm. even when we're not going to see human gore, we are going to see something reminiscent of human gore. And we see something that I think is even more important than that gore for emphasizing the human factor of this, which is that we get lines of dialogue from the pilots of the gyms that tell us in brief snatches who these people are, what they want, what they're feeling. We see bits of their pride, their terror. The last thing I want to say about the mobile suits is to point out a really neat thing that happens to Camille after he escapes from the colony. And that's that they are covered by a barrage from the Argama's mega particle cannon. And one of these stray blasts hits Camille's Mark II, and he takes a little bit of damage. Not too much, just a little bit. But then it breaks the oxygen seal of his cockpit, and we can hear not only the alarm, but we can hear the oxygen hissing as it leaves the cockpit. <laughs> And then Camille does a very neat little thing where he like tears off some pieces of fabric from his shirt and he lets them drift and the oxygen leaving the cockpit just draws the fabric to the breach and seals it. Yeah, it is very neat. Very clever, very neat. It does two really interesting things, one of which is to emphasize the space nature of this world. They are out in outer space. It is a hostile environment. 
they are only safe because of their sealed mobile suits. And that was something that first Gundam rarely did. We rarely dealt with the inherent danger of space. And the other half of that is it shows us the fragility of the mobile suit. And it really makes it feel more like a machine and less like a super robot. I think Zeta Gundam desperately needs a new translation. And I don't mean the compilation movies of Zeta Gundam that are called a new translation. I mean, somebody needs to go through and retranslate all the dialogue in this show because it's got some problems. I don't know how the dub is. We haven't listened to it yet. I'm sure we will at some point, especially once we can get our voice acting consultant to join us. But when you're writing dialogue for a character, how they say something has as much of an impact on how that character is viewed as what they're saying. So different characters should say things in different ways. And then when you're writing subtitles, you can only have so many words on screen at any given time, and people can only read those words so fast. You have to be able to keep up with what the voice actor is saying. So generally, you want to try to be kind of sparse and elegant with your language. Use fewer words instead of more. But everyone in Zeta Gundam talks like they are trying to fill out the minimum word requirement for a high school essay. I listened to a few of the scenes that Tom had a particular problem with. <laughs> uh, one is Fa and her mother in the car talking. And one is Bright and uh, Basque arguing. And I want to clarify, I had a lot of problems <laughs> with a lot of scenes. These are just two that I picked because they're particularly egregious. And obviously, I'm not a professional translator and I'm not fluent in Japanese. I'm not going to pretend that I am. But I, if I had to try to identify the problem, I think the translators are being too literal. They are trying to convey the precise words and the literal meaning of what's being said in Japanese rather than the emotional content or the sense <laughs> of the words. And so things that are phrased as questions are depicted as questions, even though they're not really questions. The line that Fa's mother says after Fa has said, space noids hate this place because it's full of titans, which is not, by the way, what Fa says. She says something much longer and more annoying, but <laughs> I'm abbreviating. <laughs> what Fa's mother says to that is, but we never approved the plan to make this place a titan's base, which like she could have said, we didn't want the titans here either. Or it's not as if we wanted them here. Or... We didn't say they could build a base here. Nobody asked us. Right. Any one of those would have been shorter, punchier, conveyed the same meaning more clearly. With better emotion. And would have been more emotionally appropriate for the situation that they are in, which is fleeing from a mobile suit battle that is literally destroying their neighborhood and blowing up buildings all around them. And then do you also have the text of I do. what Basque says? Oh, I have what Bright says. Oh, okay. Because I, I particularly noticed what Basque says because they translate it as something like, how are we supposed to complete our mission if we have to worry about space noids? But what he means is we can't be bothered to worry about space noids. <laughs> I found the Bright one more egregious for the simple reason that up until now, we have not met Fa's mother. We haven't met Basque. Maybe they do talk like that. Maybe that's just how they are as people. We know Bright. We spent 43 episodes with Bright. We know that Bright is not a long-winded kind of guy. He's pretty direct. Yeah. Remember his line, we haven't got time for philosophy. <laughs> Bright's lines in First Gundam are really punchy. And then in Zeta, when he is complaining to Basque, he says... The more you proceed to convert the colony as your base, the more you're encouraging the Ayug to develop. We talked about that scene earlier, and I believe our translation was something like, the more you brutalize these people, the more you drive them to join Ayug, or you drive them into Ayug's arms, or you strengthen yeah. Ayug. Like, there's so many better ways to say that. <laughs> the more you take over this colony, the worse you're making it. Or... That whole line, you're just making things worse. <laughs> How can you not see that? Oppressing space noids just makes them support Ayug more. 
And these really emphasize the logistical problem here because all of these lines are so long that they have to be split in half with ellipses and done in two separate sets of subtitles, which makes it harder to read and makes it harder to understand what's being said. This is another scene where I strongly suspect that the problem is they are trying to include all of the words that were in the <laughs> Japanese, even though they're not necessary. They're trying to include the same vocabulary, the same words that were present in the original spoken to the detriment of meaning and storytelling. It's also a situation where even if you kept exactly the line that they're using, there are superfluous words. You don't need to say, the more you proceed to convert this base. You can just say, the more you convert this base. You don't need to say, you're encouraging the AUG to develop. You can just say, you're encouraging the AUG, or you're helping the AUG. Zeta has kind of a reputation for being confusing at times. And I wonder how much of that is just how long-winded and literal ha. the translation is. To be fair, we also found Camille's behavior a little confusing <laughs> in these first couple episodes, so that it's clearly not all a translation issue, mm -hmm. but it certainly doesn't help. It's a tiny thing, but one which I think is entirely indicative of the increase in detail and the increase in animation quality in Zeta. As Camille is leaving, he sees the burnt wreckage of his house, and in the dark gray smoke rising out of the wreckage and the fire, there are tiny red embers and sparks. It's not just a gray shape. <laughs> it has movement and these little details in it. Like I said, it's a little thing. But to take the trouble to do it shows how much more money they had, how many more people they had on staff, probably, and how much more sort of bandwidth to have that level of detail, to add those little bits to the scenery, to the animation, to bring it to life. This week, we research and discuss bird lime, colonialism, and how it influenced Zeta, and Camille's name. During his team's escape, with Camille Bidon and two captured Mark II Gundams as prizes, Lieutenant Quattro uses a substance that he calls bird lime to create a partial barrier across the hole in the side of the colony from whence his team entered and through which his team is now departing. For reasons that will become clear in a moment, I think this is probably the same glue-like substance that he used to incapacitate a pair of witnesses during his infiltration of Green Noah 2, aka Grips, early in Episode 1. The name bird lime is used for a variety of different substances developed independently around the world throughout history. The ingredients that go into these different bird limes vary wildly from one preparation to the next. Because it's really, what do you have available to you in your local natural environment that allows you to create this substance? And because the ingredients that go into it are so different, the methods for manufacturing it can be as simple as chew these berries a little bit, or as complex as boil it, store it, pound it into a paste, wash it, ferment it, skim it, heat it, and mix it with oil and turpentine. <laughs> But in every case, the final product is a sticky paste that can be spread on the branches of trees. Birds that alight on the branches get stuck, and as they struggle to escape, they become more and more stuck. And eventually, the bird becomes exhausted by the struggle, and either succumbs into a kind of stupor that makes them easy to take alive, or else they thrash themselves to death. It's awful. Yeah, it's really horrible. It's illegal in most places now, both because it is a particularly cruel way to kill a bird, but also because the traps don't discriminate between lawful bird catching and endangered bird catching. Mm -hmm. So in most of the industrialized world, at least, bird liming is not legal. So don't, don't listen to this, think it's a good idea, and then go outside and start spreading glue on trees. Don't do it. I found the name pretty interesting because I was wondering if bird lime contained limestone or something. It doesn't. Lime, in this case, is a very old word that means like a paste. 
And it shares an etymology with like the Latin word for mud, things like that. Mm. So this is like bird paste. Ooh. Interestingly, bird lime has had some real world military applications. Although to my great disappointment, I was never able to find any examples where large amounts of it were used to block passages or gum up the works of machinery. That would have been really cool. But in actuality, it was still pretty cool. So remember back during season one, we talked several times about one of the most difficult problems facing military leaders during World War II. And that was how could infantry without heavy weapons threaten armored vehicles? The key to this whole problem was how could a human person, notoriously squishier and more susceptible to blast damage than a tank, get close enough to a tank for their weapon to be effective without themselves being caught in the explosion? In episode 1.17, we talked about the US Army's bazooka, a handheld rocket launcher that proved to be the most enduring solution to this man versus tank problem. But before that, in episode 1.14, we talked about two kinds of magnetic grenade, the German Hafthaladung and the Japanese Type 99 mine. The idea behind both of those was that you could place the explosive on the tank, set the fuse, and then run for it, confident that the powerful magnets would keep the bomb in place until it detonated. Over in England, facing a similar question, they came up with a very different solution, one that caught on in popular culture and has stuck around ever since, appearing most recently in video games like Halo and Fortnite. I'm talking about the number 74, or colloquially, the sticky bomb. <laughs> the sticky bomb looked like a maraca. <laughs> there was a sheet metal sphere attached to a wooden handle. But when it was time to use it, the sheet metal sphere was actually just a case for the real weapon. It would open and would fall away, revealing within a smaller glass or plastic sphere wrapped inside what was essentially a sock coated in special military grade bird lime. Inside of that was 1.25 pounds or around 0.6 kilograms of nitroglycerin. So the sticky bomb would be thrown at the target tank with enough force to break that inner plastic or glass sphere. It would then deform on contact, spreading out across the target surface like a pancake. And the bird lime would keep it stuck in place while the fuse burned down and the person who'd placed it ran for dear life. The sticky bomb was originally designed for a hypothetical desperate defense of the English homeland. It was intended for use by soldiers and civilians alike. It was most effective when used against the relatively horizontal armor plates on the tops of tanks, and so it was imagined that sticky bombs could be dropped out of the windows of houses as German tanks rolled by on the streets outside. They were only meant to be issued to the home guard, the force that actually was supposed to defend England proper, but somehow a supply of sticky bombs found their way to North Africa, where British and Commonwealth forces put them to excellent use. In particular, the Australians figured out that you could actually just sneak up to a tank, slap the bomb onto it, and then sneak safely away, rather than trying to throw it from a distance. <laughs> sneak, sneak. <laughs> sneak, sneak. Sticky bombs were also used during the Allied invasion of Italy, most famously by the joint American-Canadian commando unit known as the Black Devils as well as by the French resistance. In Gundam, though, I think the intended application is closer to Birdlime's original purpose. It was not entirely clear what the point of Quattro Birdliming that breach in the colony wall was. It's not going to stop the air from escaping, and it's not going to prevent any hapless colonists from getting sucked out into space a la Tem Ray. But I think that the most likely explanation is that he is making it harder for Titan or Federation mobile suits operating inside the colony to pursue his team out into space. That seems likely. We've already seen that the Gym 2s operating inside the colony are not nearly as maneuverable as the Rick Diaz units. And we also saw that Camille had some difficulty avoiding the bird lime, even though he was piloting the advanced, highly maneuverable Mark II. So you can just imagine some poor Federation grunt trying to chase them in, out into space and getting caught in what's basically a spider web. Well, and any person who gets caught makes passage for the subsequent person basically impossible. We are going to be returning again and again throughout Zeta to the political situation. Earth and the Sides, Earthlings and Space Noids, the Federation, the Titans, Zeon, Ayug, and the way in which all of these overlap, intersect, and interact. It seems clear enough that we are seeing parallels to the decolonization of the post-World War II world, 
But before we delve into specifics, before we look for similarities to particular events of the 60s and 70s, it's worth delving into some terms. What characterizes the colonial governments that inspired Zeta's federation government? The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines colonialism as a practice of domination which involves the subjugation of one people to another. Sometimes people make a distinction between colonialism and imperialism, where colonialism involves the transfer of population to a new territory versus one country exercising power over another uh, through sovereignty and indirect means of control without significant settlement. But for our purposes, there's no meaningful distinction here because there was no pre-existing like alien population (laughs) Uh, so we'll be talking about colonialism and we'll mean all of those systems of control there are a ton of different motivations for colonialism and types of colonialism i'm going to talk specifically about the ones that i think are relevant to the universal century to the universe that the show takes place in We have extractive, which is to say resource extraction motivated. We already know that this was done in the case of Luna 2. Trade, which is to say captive markets, heavy tariffs, and heavily policed smuggling or black markets all lead to wealth and capital accumulating in the home, quote unquote, country. It's not yet been discussed in the show, but it's highly likely. (laughs) Transport, so access to convenient or even necessary hubs for wider transportation or exploration. We know that there have been expeditions to Jupiter for resource extraction. Imagine if Earth forces did not have free access to the space colonies. Resource extraction in space would be much more complicated, dangerous, and expensive. Well, and we saw in First Gundam that having access to the sides around the moon was essential for getting access to the side behind the moon. The Federation had to control those sides in the moon's orbit in order to be able to go to Xeon. Mm -hmm. There is a sort of colonial nimbyism. (laughs) If you're not familiar with the term, nimby is not in my backyard. Uh, Colonizers sometimes want an empty place far away as a wasteland for depositing convicts or conducting dangerous experiments. Like if you wanted a research facility to develop new mobile suits. Many of you probably already know, but a lot of the early colonization of Australia was the UK sending convicts there. Uh, Parts of North America, too. Georgia, I believe. mm -hmm. There was forced relocation of Marshall Islanders for U.S. atomic experiments. Uh, We know from the intro of the first series that humanity's burgeoning population was pushed out into space. Our speculation is that this largely came down to class. It could certainly have been other factors. Part of France's reason for colonial expansion was a sense that massive population increases in France led to more political instability. And so if they had places they could send all these extra people, (laughs) it would bleed off a significant portion of the the instability and the sort of population restlessness that they had at home. Mm Mm-hmm. Finally, rogue colonialism, which is to say colonialism initiated by non-governmental groups. This is a less talked about story, but it should be talked about more. Hawaii (laughs) is a case of this. There was a coup, essentially, uh, led and supported by the Dole Pineapple plantation owners that led to Hawaii becoming a U.S. state. The government had not intended for that to happen. (laughs) However, once the coup had been instated... uh, it became almost unavoidable. The, I may be wrong on that. I didn't read as deeply about that. So my apologies if I'm, uh, I'm sure there's much more to that situation. That could be like a whole research piece <laughs> on its own. Yeah. And it's very easy, especially now in a time of private corporations getting into spaceships, space exploration, uh, to imagine possible corporate involvement in creating the space colonies. Didn't Jeff Bezos just suggest building space colonies? Yeah. Well, and O'Neill cylinders. Yep. But yeah, it's very easy to see corporations perhaps leading those resource extraction efforts. And then you get this transition from lawless space where they're like, oh, but this is not, this is not part of Earth. Like you don't govern this place to... If at that time there was a unified Earth Federation government, them saying, oh, we absolutely cannot allow (laughs) like a lawless, stateless place to exist. We are absolutely going to make it part of the Federation. Of course, colonizers have numerous justifications for their actions. 
Uh, perhaps one of the most well-known is the quote-unquote civilizing mission, which is to say religious, moral, or cultural, this attitude that the people being colonized are somehow less advanced in some way, and thus that being colonized and being forced to adopt certain religious, moral, and cultural trappings will make them more advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, I found this fascinating quote that was talking about Spanish conquest in North and South America, and it was determined at one point by the church, by the Catholic church, that non-believers had legitimate dominion over themselves and their property, but this dominion was abrogated, was removed, if they proved incapable of governing themselves according to principles that every reasonable person would recognize. <laughs> so, like, define reasonable person, define incapable. Yeah. This made it very easy for Europeans to say, oh, because of X, Y, and Z, they clearly are incapable of governing themselves and we have to go in. Well, this is the, the real life situation encapsulated so perfectly in the Eddie Izzard joke. Well, have you got a flag? <laughs> no flag, no country. Those are the rules that I just now made up. Various Enlightenment thinkers challenged this civilizing mission ideal, uh, one of whom, Diderot, talked specifically about the fact that the colonizer, far from the legal and social structures that normally guide and restrict their behavior and impose consequences, would be significantly more brutal than they would be back at home. Sort of a Lord of the Flies attitude. Mm -hmm. The colonizers will, in fact, be less civilized than they would be at home because nobody is watching them and there are no consequences to their actions. Which made me think of Apocalypse Now. <laughs> Well, Apocalypse Now is based on Heart of Darkness, which is all about exactly that. Yeah. There was also this attitude that the colonizers were providing necessary aid to the colonized because of the inability of the colony to be self-sufficient or protect itself. Theoretically, a colony would gradually gain self-sufficiency and would be granted sovereignty, but in practice... Sovereignty would never be granted, the goalposts would constantly be moved, or it would be granted in name only, with heavy economic and political control still in place. It seems pretty obvious that an in-progress space colony would not be self-sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> However, once they're completed, they look completely self-sufficient. We can't know that. They don't get into heavy economics discussions, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> we don't hear a lot about imports from Earth or anything like that, but... They seem quite self-sufficient. Uh, and now we get into some of the commonalities and the negative effects in how colonial governments operate and the effect they have on the colonized people. John Stuart Mill, who was a British philosopher, economist, uh, and also employee of the British East India Company. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating how many, like, Enlightenment and later era philosophers and thinkers if they were European, clearly had very ambivalent feelings about colonization. They were like, well, it's bad, but... Uh, I strongly recommend listening to Mike Duncan's Revolutions podcast, particularly this season, which I believe is season four, about the Haitian Revolution. Mm. Because the Haitian Revolution overlapped with the French Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution was a revolution against French control. And so you have these moments in the French Revolution where you have all these great foundational documents of European revolutionary theory, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, things like that. And as they're being drafted, you have people saying, like, all French people are born free, except Haitians. <laughs> <laughs> because we want, obviously, we want revolution and republicanism and progress, and but we, we can't do without the money coming from our colonies. Ooh. So anyway, John Stuart Mill clearly in an awkwardly ambivalent position about this, but outlined some of the pitfalls, shall we say, of a colonial government. Firstly, that they are unlikely to have knowledge of local conditions necessary to solve local problems effectively. And this immediately made me think of Bright chiding Jared. You just got here. You don't, <laughs> you don't know. You don't know what meteors do. Uh, at its most extreme, laws and policies were decided in the metropole, so in the quote-unquote homeland, and local colonial officials were just supposed to make it happen. And this was happening all over Africa, like the parts of Africa colonized by the UK. This was how most of it worked. And so you had people who had no real notion of conditions on the ground saying, oh, well, this is what the taxes should be. This is what your trade policy should be. And, you know, here's the long list of things to make happen. Go do it. <laughs> 
Uh, and it's easy to see how that might frustrate our space noids. <laughs> it also makes me think of Red Planet. Classic Heinlein science fiction book about a colony on Mars revolting. They revolt for two reasons. The more libertarian reason is that the government is trying to restrict uh, their ability to carry arms. <laughs> But the second reason is that because of the way temperatures fluctuate on Mars, the entire population migrates twice a year to different regions that have livable temperatures. And the government has just ordered that because they see this as very inefficient and a waste of everyone's time and money, they are no longer to migrate, even though that would actually, like, not migrating would kill a bunch of people. <laughs> the bigger the empire the less likely centralized government is to understand the unique conditions in any one part. If you want another horrible but also kind of funny example of this, just look at the history of the British Empire trying to cut down on the snake population in India. What? <laughs> they had this whole sequence of policies to try to reduce the snake population in India, including bounties on snakes, which just led to local people breeding snakes. <laughs> <laughs> Clever. And so once they figured out that these bounties had just resulted in a cottage industry of snake breeding, they got rid of the bounties. And so all the snake breeders just released all of their snakes, <laughs> leading to a dramatic increase in the <laughs> amount of snakes. Then you have the fact that cultural differences mean the colonizer is less likely to sympathize with the colonized and more likely to act tyrannically. They will also have a natural tendency to sympathize or side with people similar to themselves that will lead to distortions in the case of conflict. Who wins legal cases? Who wins trade disputes? Things like that. Uh, and finally, that economic interests are going to come before any interest in local development. Outsiders are not invested, really, in the conditions locally. They're interested in making a buck. And to the extent that they do develop the local economy, it is going to be in ways that make it inextricably tied to the metropole. It's not going to be an economy that can support an independent country, it's going to be an economy that produces necessary components for the industrial economy of the metropole. These governments are characterized by systemic violence that is organized, purposeful, and continuous. One element of this is occupation of land. The local population had no choice about the Titan's base. It just got put there. Uh, there's control of resources and geopolitical advantages. There's control of the population itself. Uh, they control the labor market and keep labor cheap for things where they want labor to be cheap. They have a captive market for goods. They siphon off labor resources. The best and the brightest are recruited for the Federation military, removing them from their home side, removing them as a possible threat to Federation hegemony. This part felt particularly insidious to me. Yeah, and it also employs them in the perpetuation of that Federation domination. The colonized are effectively held captive in their own land and forced to serve colonial interests. This has not been made explicit, but when they mention that most of the space noids have no identification or a different class of identification, there's a strong implication in that that they do not have free movement. They can't just choose to go to another side or to go to Earth. They, they would not be able to do so. Well, and throughout that first episode, we see Camille a couple of times using his ID. He rents a car with it. He gets access to the linear car with it, which allows him to go to the spaceport. Presumably, a space noid without the same level of identification that Camille has might not be able to do either of those things. Frequently the colonized population are subject to an entirely different legal system and have fewer rights. Uh, being held without charges is a frequent one. If you were a space noid with no identification, he'd have kept you here for days. Or, in the case of parts of colonized Africa, months, maybe years. Uh, policing is an instrument of government control. The separation of police from the policed population and a very hierarchical system, like a separation of officers from the rank and file, increases the police's ability to control the populace and the government's ability to control the police. The police are less likely to have any sympathy for the local population, which means they are less likely to side with the local population against the government, which would be a risk with a local police force. And we note that we don't actually see any local police in Green Noah 1. Even though it is more or less a civilian colony, it is policed by military police. 
And as we saw, the Titans are only recruited from Earth. And all of the Titans we've met so far have been officers. Unlike in First Gundam, where we practically never encountered an officer, in Zeta, we are thick with officers, and we see very few enlisted except running around, unnamed in the background. This also allows the government to use the police as a target for public dissatisfaction. The government can direct public ire at the police rather than at the government itself. We even see this just in these couple of episodes, how many of the space noids are angry at the Titans, but not at the Federation government. <laughs> when presumably that's who the Titans report to in some way. Mm -hmm. But they're angry at what they see and encounter day to day. And it's harder to think in that like abstract, okay, but what about? The first thing Camille does when he gets into the Mark II, it's not like, I'm going to smash the state. I'm going to join the AU. It's like, I'm going to go harass that military police officer who was brutalizing me earlier. Finally, one important aspect of control of the population is the erosion of local culture, beliefs, religion, and social connections. Violence and propaganda can only do so much. Uh, so they develop a class of local elites who serve the interests of the colonizer, usually cultivated through prestigious schools and things like that. Camille's parents feel like an example of this. Absolutely. <laughs> Camille's whole school, this very like idyllic, upper-class feeling mm. school, a lot of people engaged in leisure, but also hierarchy and violence. Yeah, during the uh, British practice of indirect rule, governors would work with already existing local institutions or governments, but you had to toe the line or they'd replace you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were in power as long as you didn't cost them too much trouble and you did more or less what they wanted you to do. Uh, and some people were able to use that position to try to benefit their people. Some people abused that position and became tyrannical. Uh but the truth was you were you were not the ultimate authority even in your own country. <laughs> mm -hmm. And finally, one paper that I looked at talked about how the colonizer contests reality and memory. Hmm. To preserve the status quo, they have to valorize the benevolent colonizer. Which made me wonder, what is the Federation propaganda about the one-year war like? Yeah. That the Federation and Earth forces saved the vulnerable sides from Xeon domination? Probably. Yeah. Uh, and the other side of that coin is to invalidate and demonize the colonized? Xeon becomes synonymous with all space noids. In effect, the Federation is forced by this narrative to save the space noids from themselves. A final element... There's often the theoretical possibility of citizenship held out over a colonized population. We mentioned the idea earlier, there's this implication that they are not citizens with full rights in the way that Earthlings are. You hold out this hope of citizenship to keep people striving, even though it is almost impossible. Uh, one example I read in French colonies was to become a French citizen, you had to speak French fluently, you had to do military service, you had to have won certain awards and commendations. It was basically impossible. I'm sure a couple of people did it, but it was not a realistic prospect. Uh, but it was held out as like, oh, but you can earn the right. You can earn the right to become a full citizen. And we see that... Here as well, with that same conversation about, oh, if you get good enough grades and you do impressively enough, then you could be a soldier. Then you'd be one of us. But you'd better toe the line, because this kind of bad behavior, and any, any support for AUG is going to disqualify you, buddy. After last week's episode, Linny, one of our listeners, expressed some surprise that we were pronouncing that one character's name, Camille, the way it's said in English, where it is used almost exclusively as a woman's name, instead of the French name Camille, which is spelled identically, but is given to both men and women. Now that he has stolen a Gundam, thus declaring proudly to the world, I will be your protagonist, <laughs> I think we should take a few minutes to talk properly about his name. And by the time we're done, I think we're going to see some interesting hints about where Zeta means to go. And we'll encounter at least one question about the Universal Century that has never been answered to my satisfaction. <laughs> First, the bear facts. In the Japanese, Camille's name is pronounced Kamiyu. In the English dub, it's pronounced Camille. But I'm not going to take pronunciation advice from dubbed anime. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, there's never been a French dub. 
His last name is Bidon, which is a French surname from around the Brittany region. But his parents have the English name Franklin and the English Germanic Norse name Hilda, so the family does not appear to be French per se. Now for a little bit of context in the Universal Century. While our fiery young protagonist insists that his is a man's name, it's also clear that no one around him thinks so. I guarantee that he did not go and pick a fight with half a dozen members of the Space Gestapo because he heard his name mocked for the very first time ever. And remember, no one ever says, Camille, that's an odd name I've never heard before. They say things like, I heard a girl's name, but surprise, it's a boy. So we know that his name is not particularly obscure. That gives us two possibilities. One, his parents named him Camille, intending the French version of the name, possibly in tribute to the Bidon family's French heritage from before his parents' generation. But he lives in a culture where the French version of the name is unknown, while the feminine Camille is prominent. Perhaps his parents call him Camille at home, but everyone else calls him Camille. Or, his parents named him Camille, intending to give him the feminine version of the name. We can only speculate as to their motivations, but after all, such things do happen. There's even a whole song about why you might name a boy Sue. Is Camille ever a surname? Probably at some point, but I don't think it's a common one. No, but just it's, it's common enough for men to be given a surname as a first name and for that surname to be feminine. Mm -hmm. Say Ashley from Gone with the Wind. True. That could happen. I've met Lindsay's where that was the case, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one possible <laughs> explanation. <laughs> so given all of that, which pronunciation do you think we should use going forward? I think Camille, but what do you think? I also think Camille. I think that's clearly what is used. When when Camille is arguing with Fa, he doesn't say, it's Camille. Not, he doesn't like correct her pronunciation. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't want to hear his name. <laughs> <laughs> and when Jared hears Fa say it, it sounds to him like the feminine Camille. Mm-hmm. Although that raises a second question, which is, what language is everyone in the Universal Century using when they speak to each other? Huh. Yeah. Because it's not Japanese, right? Kamiyu is not a typically feminine Japanese name. There are no references to Japan. There's no references to the Japanese language or the Japanese people. So they're speaking something, but what? I mean, we in the first series, we talked about the which side of the road they drive on. And that being a possible indication of a certain, like, globalized world that they live in, I suppose because we don't see any other markers and because what little signage we do see is in English, that they are all speaking English. That may be so. There's some evidence from way, way, way in the future of Gundam that I think undermines that a little bit, but that's a long way away. <laughs> But keep this question in mind, because there's never really been an answer to it. We never see anybody have language difficulties. We hear people comment on accents, uh, but they all understand each other. Yeah. And so clearly there is a universal language. There's one, and they're all speaking it. But what is it? <laughs> clearly it's Esperanto. <laughs> Future Esperanto. Now, why did Camille's parents name him that is an interesting question, but one that we can't really answer. There's another more interesting question, which I think we might actually be able to figure out, and that's why did Tomino name him that? The names that Tomino gives his characters are famously weird, but they're also often meaningful. We've seen that over and over again. And even when we encounter a name that doesn't have a discernible meaning, we can never be sure if the name is actually meaningless or if there's just too much cultural, linguistic, and personal distance between us and Tomino's very weird brain. If we could step inside his very weird brain for just a moment, perhaps we could even unlock the true and secret understanding of Gelgug. <laughs> so why Camille? Or Camille? Or Camille? Oddly, in the mid-1980s, that name suddenly started cropping up all over the place in art. There was Gundam in 85, of course. There was also a French movie earlier that same year, a British stage play in 86. And then in 86 and 87, American musician Prince worked extensively on a concept album that was eventually canceled but would have been called Camille. Hmm. 
Besides all being written within that same short span of years and having characters named Camille or Camille, all of these works are linked artistically by similar themes, and through their connection to the same century-old story. Herculine Barbin was born in western France in 1838. An intersex person, Herculine was assigned female at birth and raised in a convent boarding school. After living for 23 years as a woman in an almost exclusively female environment, a series of medical examinations resulted in legally compelled gender reassignment, and, unwillingly, Herculine became a man in the eyes of society. In memoirs written after this forced reassignment, Herculine uses feminine language when describing the period prior to the reassignment and masculine language afterward. But it also seems that Herculine regarded the reassignment as a cruel and ridiculous punishment and wanted to continue living as a woman. So, out of respect, we are going to use female pronouns to describe her. During the first part of her life, she was known familiarly as Alexina. She possessed both male and female sexual characteristics, but although the male aspects of these became more pronounced during puberty, it was only when she sought aid from a doctor on her own initiative that the intersex nature of her body became known. She was then subjected to a series of examinations and legal proceedings, which ultimately concluded that her, and I am attaching quotation marks firmly around this bit of 1800s medical terminology, true sex was male. <laughs> now under legal compulsion, she left her entire life, her job, and every person, institution, and manner of being that she had ever known behind, changed her name, moved to Paris, wrote her memoirs, and then killed herself. She was 30 years old. And so really incredibly sad story. In her own time, her life and death passed largely without notice. But a century later, French philosopher Michel Foucault discovered her memoirs in an old medical archive while researching the history of sexuality and gender. In 1978, he published them, and in 1980, he published an English translation accompanied by his own commentary and some supplementary materials. Besides their impact on gender and sexuality studies in the 80s, the memoirs were made into the 1985 film The Mystery of Alexina, and Herculine Barbon appeared as a character in the 1986 play A Mouthful of Birds, and she inspired the Pulitzer Prize-winning book Middlesex. But where is the Gundam connection in all of this? Well, remember that I said that Herculine changed her name when she was forced to become, in the eyes of society, a man? She changed it to Camille. And that concept album Prince was working on around the same time? The concept was that he was going to produce a full album of songs with the pitch of his voice artificially changed to make it sound either androgynous or feminine, and that he would release the album not under his own name, but under the name of a female alter ego, Camille. This concept album, and the choice of the name Camille, is believed to have been inspired by Herculine Barbon's memoirs. So, Camille, or Camille, is a name that bridges the boundary between masculine and feminine. We already knew that just from seeing Camille and Jared arguing and fighting in the first episode over, essentially, whether it's a man's name or a woman's name, and everything I've said today only reinforces that interpretation. But beyond that, in the context of the era, giving the name Camille to the main character of the show is a hint that gender, what it means, how we define it, and how it controls our behavior is going to be a major theme throughout Zeta. And for Camille himself, perhaps it is a hint that much of his behavior is an effort to conform himself to the expectations forced on him by circumstances and society. Yeah, I was going to say, it's hard to imagine that Tomino would be saying anything necessarily about trans issues or intersex issues specifically, but it's very easy to imagine that Tomino wants us to think about what it means in our society to be a man or a woman, how those expectations affect people. Yeah, because Camille is a name for a person who is forced to act like a man, whether they want to or not. Next time on episode 2.4, The White Flag, Tom says Galbaldi. Galbaldi. Even future elevators are cramped. Happy Father's Day to Camille's dad. Lady Char. Jared experiences his first ever moment of doubt. New type underground. Why is Bright still here? Emma is naive, like, shockingly so. 
Is anyone here not a lieutenant? Folks, I think this one might be darker. And slaps, tears, and unpronounceable names. Rekoa, Rekoa, Rechua, Rekola? Rekoa. Mira Ryla Mirara. Mira 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 <laughs> You will see the tears of time. Remember to do all of the podcast things. Subscribe and review Mobile Suit Breakdown wherever you get your podcasts. Then pledge your undying devotion to Mobile Suit Breakdown on Patreon, where you can find great bonus content, get access to the MSB Discord, get exclusive MSB merchandise, and, you know, support the podcast. You can also follow at Gundam Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, and like us at facebook.com slash Gundam Podcast for all kinds of extra content. And you should always check out our website, GundamPodcast.com, for all of our episodes, show notes, watch list, wish list, some other lists, and more. Plus, you can always email your questions, comments, and complaints to GundamPodcast at gmail.com. Or just shout your wrong Gundam opinion to us in person by coming to scenic New York City and yelling, the best part about Gundam is how it never gets all political on any busy street corner. We'll totally hear you. The intro song is Wasp by Misha Dioxin, and the closing music is Long Way Home by Spinning Ratio. You can find links and more in the show notes. And thank you for listening. The big question we were both asking ourselves throughout this episode, 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 Yes, I took two trays worth of ice cubes for my single cup of tea. There is none left. That was very funny, but a little derailing. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Titans and other earthlings have been... I used the word in my notes, but I need something else. High-handed, oppressive. And we're back. Hey, you. Hey, you. Get off of my lawn. Get out of my colony. In effect, the Federation was forced in this narrative to save the Spacenoids from themselves. Can you do that one again? It's hard. It's so many S's. (laughs) That was, to borrow a phrase from Richard's, aces. (laughs) Can I say porn? Yeah, you can say porn. Porn is not a dirty word, it's just a word about dirtiness. Yeah, anyway. Anyway.